introduction. I have to leave that it's new to every Muslim, increasing awareness and obligation to see halal food is actually it's there. Rapid growth in the Muslim population. In fact, we are the fastest growing population in the world. The fastest, yeah? About 1.5, seems to be 1.1 something. Uh, rapid growth in the Muslim population, the primary market for halal food. The world is now actually about 1.8 billion people of Muslim, which is about 25%. Increasing demand for halal and toy food in primary markets. That's what we are. As a background, the skills and increasing demand for halal products and services globally. Halal industry is spending also the problems of integrity in halal supply chain. But we keep a note that we are not perfect, so mistakes are made by everybody. Issues on integrity of the halal supply chain, as mentioned one of the speakers. This is actually still uh, areas that we need to close gaps. Minor differences between one half and rest, that is actually something that we, can, we cannot avoid. Harmonization of halal standard is difficult, but crucial. You can have the standards, but the enforcement, the surveillance, it has to go back to the national authority. You can't do on to another country. Emphasis on the importance of regulating halal certification in exporting countries. If you're an importer, you need to strengthen your uh, import control system. You need to check your port of uh, leaving and you have to make sure whatever actually of the uh, those food imported are actually meeting your requirements. <coughs> what the concept we mean, halal and toy food. Uh, this is the world map. This is where the major uh, uh, majority population Muslim in the northern Africa and also the Middle East and we have the other parts in South Asia. <coughs> These are in total about 22 to 35 percent. <coughs> but the advanced principle of our Muslim diet is food has to be halal and toilet. All food halal except as you mentioned, as we mentioned earlier. But apart from that, apart from the much those mentioned in the Quran, pork, blood, carrion, those animals also without the name of Allah and Lika. Uh, those plants, chemicals, whatever, as long as they are not poisonous, they are not intoxicating, they are non hazardous to health, they are halal. For example, like plants, you say halal, plants are all halal. But as long as they are not poisonous, and as long as they are non hazardous, how do you know if not hazardous? Then the element of warranty already, you don't have enough research and development. How can you say it is hazardous? For example, like this Coca Cola. We have done research on that to say that it is hazardous. And then it will fall into a uh, mushka or mushku. Uh, then you have an area to say that there needs to be some improvement. Market potential. Increased demand for very variety of other products in primary markets. Study should offer again and again positive relationship between standards and trade. In Malaysia, any company getting halal certification, a month later you get 30% turnover over more. Then you use the guy. If you get a thousand the first month, after halal certification, automatically you get more than three thousand. It's always the case. Even we did this study in Malaysia. The world halal market estimated at two point one trillion, not billion, trillion US dollars, and food alone is about seven hundred billion US dollars. This is good news to the industry because you will never go wrong if you get your product halal certified. The incidence of fraud and deception in halal food market has first demand for denying halal products and these need certification. You cannot simply ask a person to say, hey, my product is halal, you need to have a third party. Halal market is definitely going to be in the next mainstream and they will be into investment into great countries, which are Brazil, Russia, India and China. One thing is because the population is huge. Pardon? Oh, there's another one. Ah, I see, sorry. <laughs> South Africa, no, you have Brick. Oh, this was actually like, my early reading. Oh, you have another one, Brick, sir. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, my, my material, my literature says only this. Okay, okay, I'll improve. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> this is the global halal market. It was projected in 2010 that the halal food market will increase with the increasing population. Yeah, this was actually our old uh, database. This is actually 
benefit from our Ministry of International Trade and Industry. And I wanted to emphasize here about the services. Because services actually value at about 1 trillion US dollars. Non food 1.52. You know non food? They are all those cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. They are in little size, but they cost so much money. Yeah? But not this one. Food. They are in such a big volume. But it costs you much less. Yeah? This is in monetary value. You look into how the direct world market market. We actually in, uh, evaluate the value of halal food or halal market in that continent. For example, Central and South America, uh, they have like 820 million worth, you yeah, see. Because Brazil, for one, is actually the largest producer for halal poultry. Their chicken goes everywhere in the world. For example, like the lake will go to Russia, uh, the bread goes to Middle East. I mean, this is what actually they, they, they said, because the export uh, region. And you think to Australia, they have like 525 million US dollars worth. So they're exporting a lot of lamb and, and, and beef. Yeah? Uh, we have a lot from um, Asia, 386 million. This is actually much more on, from Thailand, uh, from India, from China, from Japan. They, they have a lot of products being halal certified. And next we have Africa. You can definitely beat this and beat that. Yeah? If you, if you really work much harder, I think Cape Town is actually the nice place because you're just located in the middle. And I could see that you just travel and get whatever things to get out from here. Yeah? You, you can just go. Because I think uh, if you go from here to here, you just go everywhere because it's a meeting place. It's, it's a conventional food and you should revise that again. So they actually took about 3.1 trillion US dollars annually. Right, market potential. <laughs> Let's look market potential by product classes. This was done by Ethelstat and Euro Monitor. The value in 2005, they were looking at the fast moving consumer goods, and that was 68%. And food and beverage alone, 62%. This is actually the potential for halal product clusters. So you're looking to food and beverage, 62%. Yeah? Fast moving consumer goods, those are the cosmetics and the pharmaceuticals. So there's a lot. There's a lot of them. But coming back to the industry, you divide the halal industry to two, halal products and services industry. It is a value proposition that exists between the elements of the supply chain of the intersecting industry sector. So you have everything. You have food and you have non-food. Like this slide said, components in the halal industry is food and beverage and non-food. Talking about pharmaceutical, cosmetics and stuff. But the, the, the rest, there's another component very big which we have been ignoring services. The education, the logistic, packaging, branding, the, the retailing, printed materials, the travel, the tourism, is all halal services industry by itself. So that means there's a lot of industry that we are supposed to develop as long as we empower yourself as Muslim. When you go to the bank, you say, I only want to do Islamic banking, I'll go to do anything else. Uh, that's why we empower uh, the Muslims in Malaysia, for example. We talk about halal food industry. Processed food product by itself, one, halal frozen food industry is huge. Halal chilled food industry, halal ready to eat food industry, halal snacks industry, food ingredients, halal additives, halal spices. <coughs> it was a concern about spices in Malaysia because when they dry the spices, they will be dogs all over the place. That's a very big concern. <coughs> In Malaysia, we have a big issue on this. If you want to look at the halal beverage industry, the mineral water, the cordials, the carbonated drinks, salted beverage, they are all halal, but how much are you taking them? That is why I said the empowerment of the consumer. There are halal products outside, but how much are you taking? You need to make control of your body, of your own mind, how much are you deciding to eat or to consume. In the industry by country, this is actually the largest in the world. You can see if you actually invest in flavors and sweet industry, you'll be lemonade over, over time. It's very, very big industry. And these are all actually um, taken over by the United States of America. They supply ingredients to all over the world. 
You know, ingredients, if you talk about flavors and sweet, they only order on one kilo. And they cost you like 50,000 US dollars. But you only use like one teaspoon a day in your food processing, releasing like how many thousand of bottles of drink, for example. If you need that much, this is additive, this is ingredient, they actually dictate the market. We need to do something about this, yeah? Uh, the seasonings, the hydrocolloids, proteins, fats, substitute, sweeteners, vitamins, minerals, flavors, these are all extracts, concentrated extracts. The Hana Cosmetic Pharmaceutical and Personal Care Industry, you look into the cosmetics, pharmaceuticals and personal care, not only for the ladies, also for the men, yeah? They have it now, everything. Uh, they are talking about, ah, okay, Hana Cosmetic. I remember I have all the slides before this. Every industry has um, provision of the Quranic verse. For example, the uh, Halal Cosmetic Industry, it says that in Al-Qur'an verse 22, who we all love, <coughs> love those who take unto him <coughs> in repentance and love those who purify themselves. That cosmetic. Purify, clean, be beautiful, we defy yourself. <coughs> All right, let's move on. We have Hana Pharmaceutical Industry, and this is another huge company. <coughs> we talk about the Frost and Sullivan data. You look at 2020, it was forecasted at 1.3 billion US dollars. So, pharmaceutical is a lot. But I'm looking back, why do you need to take pharmaceutical? If you have taken the right diet. You shouldn't be having problems, you know, because you take pharmaceutical products if you need or advice by the doctor. I don't think you need all this, you know, because I think if you're really properly eating the way the prophet consumes his food, I think you can close down this factory. I mean, you can close this, close this business. Because I think we are taking too much chemicals into the body, which we are not supposed to. We are supposed to allow our body to get all the organic, yeah, all the natural products, the citra. Okay, let's look into the halal services industry. I was just talking about halal product industry. Halal services industry, you look into education and training, what we do now. Islamic banking, tourism, healthcare, and catering services, medical and healthcare, certification and logo, R&D and lab, media, logistic events, Printing, publication, books are all halal services industry by itself. Yeah? Even like having events. Okay, next, what we have. Oh, what am I repeating? Okay, this is the global halal market to show you the value of services. Uh, this is, a, I've shown this. Something wrong with the slide. Or did I put it wrong? Okay, how many does training, education, and research industry? What I want to share with you here is actually in Malaysia, <laughs> where four main universities doing research in halal matters. And this is actually where I come from, you see Malaysia Sabah. We have EOP Putra Malaysia, which is actually the one who took uh, the lead. They have done their um, courses way back in 1996 with the halal and haram in food processing. And uh, I was there when I did my master's. And then International Islamic University, Malaysia, where uh, both is from. Uh, this, they have the Faculty of Review Knowledge. They have both Sharia and uh, the scientists there. And we have another one, we call it UMC Science Islam Malaysia. So we call it UMS, UPM, oh yeah. We call it uh, UMS, UPM, we call UIEM, USIM, USIM. And it's global enterprise just to show you that we are actually a small enterprise, just a training agency, doing everything just halal, whether it be for the industry, for the government authority, or for, for consumers. Okay, if you talk about halal research and development, there's too much. When we had our workshop, we discussed this, how can you do research in halal industry? We said, we need to have one sector on development of halal and other methods and product innovation. Under product innovation, we wanted to look for alternative sources. For example, today, we have problems with gelatin. How sure are you, are you that the gelatin you produce in your uh, factory is halal? Because now, today, more than 42% of gelatin supply in the world 
are all sourced from pigs. I mean, this is actually a main worry. Can we get an alternative ingredient? We are an excellent one. We are actually very much into the study of uh, using seaweed, uh, in, and then we wanted to turn that into cardinal. The function is like gelatin, but you cannot replace gelatin totally. It can become a substitute, because gelatin is actually from animal base. Even if you have all the certified halal abattoirs throughout the world, to come to a centre to send all their skins and bones, halal, sort of halal bones and skins, to be processed into gelatin. That would be what ideal, that would be wonderful. Then we can produce the halal gelatin. Because when you're processed into gelatin, you need something like 500,000 metric tons to produce 100 kilo of gelatin. It's a lot, it's a lot of raw materials that you need. The problem now is actually the raw material. We don't have enough. We look into the slaughter management R&D. This is still ongoing. Uh, we are talking about stunning, stunning, stunning again and again. Yeah? Uh, Malaysia for that for that position is we do not encourage uh, stunning. Uh, if possible, we are changing now to slaughter without stunning. There are already a few companies in Malaysia, like uh, at, at the southern part of Malaysia, they are using uh, cones now. Uh, they they just kind of, they put cones on every of the uh, chickens. So when they pass through to the slaughter, she that he or she doesn't see anybody else, you know. So they will get slaughter. They do not stun anymore the chickens. Yeah. Uh, we have halal education. This is where we wanted to empower everybody. The students at a younger age, from kindergarten and then up to primary to secondary and to university level. And we want to educate everybody. And we also have this R&D on halal policy management, marketing and consumer affairs. So there are more inside here. Yeah? Right, when you have done all those research work, uh, HTC actually provides platform to how can you share the findings or the technology that you have at the World Halal Research Summit of the conference. This is the halal service industry by itself. The Islamic finance industry is a, is a Islamic banking business, meaning banking whose aims and operations not involve any element which is not approved by the original Islam. We are talking no riba, no maizir, and no hara. So this is actually Islamic finance. I'm not good in this, sincerely. So I, I know we just put this slide on. I, I don't know how to elaborate. Halal tourism industry is actually another very, very big industry, I believe. Uh, Cape Town is one of them. You can develop this halal tourism industry, I think. Uh, you can make a lot of money into your pocket, especially the tourist centers, your travel, your hotels, your halal food. But you need to position yourself. You need to provide halal food at hotels and tourist spots. You, you don't really bother you know, whether it is a Muslim or non Muslim at frequenting the hotel, but you need to provide such food. The prayer time and keep direction in the hotels. So it's easier, you don't have to ask around. Bring area at tour site. I really appreciate if people bring me to see places. And that's actually the nearest house to perform. Solat, yeah? If this is ideal. Halal airlines and movement only hotels are up and coming investment. Trends currently gaining global popularity. We have that in Dubai. Because UAE is rich, you very rich. They, they are making all that now. Separate hotels for single women, for single men, for families and separate facilities like swimming pool and stuff. Okay, you talk about the halal food chain, it's all over. Well. From farm to transportation to storage, processing, preparation and serving. How can you really harmonize all this? If you don't go do it to standard, certification and surveillance. These are the three main elements that you really need to learn. <coughs> if you talk about farm, that is actually something quite basic. I remember when I gave a lecture in Thailand way back in 2002, one of the researchers was asking, if I have pig dung, as I apply to my vegetable, can I eat the fruit? I said, oh, in Malaysia we take, we only eat the fruit, we don't eat the soil. You know, because that is actually quite basic. Yeah, quite basic. I mean, we don't really bother about the, the uh, pig dung, because we, we don't handle that. If it is a Malay farmer, they don't they be pig dung, they will have their cow dung or chicken dung or whatnot, but not pig dung. But uh, if the Chinese, uh, we still eat the fruit because they don't really mix you know, the two. So that's actually quite basic. Uh, now, uh, there is actually demand about 
I gave him a lot of respect for free. But Justin's response was, you are more particular about what goes through human mouth, not what through animal mouth, not yet. Not yet. But I think now more pressure, because they're talking about the mixing of antibiotics. Uh, that's actually the concern now. I don't know, maybe I think eventually I definitely will agree to certify a fee, animal fee. That's going to be a big hoo-ha, I think. That's going to be a lot of work, because we're supposed to look at human food, not animal food, yeah? Yeah, something to think about. But ensuring integrity in our entire halal food value is very important. We need to have standards. What do you mean by standards? Standards are defined as documents established by consensus and approved by a recognized body that provides for common and repeated use, rules, guidelines, or characteristics for activities or the results, aimed at the achievement of the optimum degree or order in a given context. I'll share with you now the Codex Halal Guidelines, the first one that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Malaysia was actually doing this way back in 1992, and it was eventually adopted in 1997. The scope was to use the term halal and equivalent terms in claims as defined, and measures to be taken on the use of the term halal. <coughs> and the book is, is looking like that. It is a small book, just half A4 paper, yeah, but the color is yellow. And if you manage to go to Italy, if you go to Rome, or uh, to FAO office, the uh, FAO, the Food and Health Organization, you get this for free. You go to the library and ask, can I have the food labeling complete text? The general guidelines for use of the term halal is actually the last five pages. Yeah. Uh, this is actually the, the, the document about talking about supplementary guidelines on claims adopted in 1997. But what happened, they are sent all to member nations. And it is for individual governments to decide what they wanted to use the, 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 the guidelines for. Is it the law or is it for your study? It's up to you. Yeah, it is actually free to use. For your information, standards are all voluntary unless they have some legal binding. If it is legal binding, then it becomes a law. Okay, provides basic and general information on how food could be produced and clean as well. Acknowledge different design school of thought, minor differences in opinion in the interpretation of law. National Islamic Authority, that is actually in the introduction of the document. Yeah. Okay, I will share with you next on the standards of other countries. Uh, this is the only halal food standard. Uh, this is actually Malaysia, this is actually Brunei, this is Bosnia, this is Turkey, and this is Indonesia. Uh, this is from America, I think it's here, and this is Germany. Yeah, just to check. They are all halal food standards. Uh, they don't really differ. It's more or less the same. Okay, we have what now in Malaysia is all this. We have the standard for halal food, quality management system, halal cosmetics and personal care, value-based management from Islamic perspective, halal basic there are three series, transportation, storage and retaining. We have halal pharmaceutical, we have Islamic and halal principle. <coughs> These are uh, terminologies. <coughs> the latest one we have, halal bone height and fur. Talking about your leather jacket <coughs> and your leather and shoes. <coughs> okay, let's look at this document. <coughs> The Malaysian Halal Food Standard. We have it at the title. Halal Food Production, Preparation, Handling and Storage General Guideline, Second Revision. I've got to do some more two three slides. Uh, we call it the MX 2009. This is actually all the subtitles in the document. Scope, definitions, requirements, compliance, halal set, halal certification mark. I'll share you just the two. Definition. Very important. I used to tell this to everyone in the whole world so that they get the right understanding. When I presented this in Paris in 2006, one, uh, one gentleman from the audience said, I never knew you have a definition. I thought halal food is second class food. I said, oh yeah, I'm so sorry, I came late. But halal food is defined as food and drink, all the ingredients permitted under the Sharia law and fulfill the following conditions. Does not contain any parts of products of animals that are non-halal by Sharia law or any parts of products of animals which are not 
prophet according to Shari Adon. He does not contain any nudges according to Shari Adon, safe for consumption, non poisonous, non intoxicating, or non hazardous to health, not prepared, processed, or manufactured using equipment contaminated with nudges, does not contain any human parts or insolubilities that are not permitted by Shari Adon, and during its preparation, processing, handling, packaging, storage, and distribution, the food is physically separated from any other food that does not meet the above requirements that have been decreed as nudges. So you're going to ask me, what is nudges? Nudges are dogs and pigs and their descendants. Halal food that is contaminated with things that are non-halal. Halal food that comes into direct contact with things that are non-halal. This is the case where you store haram and halal products together. So you're not allowed to be explicit with nudges. Any liquid and objects discharged from the offices of human beings or animals, such as urine, blood, vomit, fat, placenta, and excrement, sperm and ova of pigs and dogs, except sperm and ova of other animals, carry on or halal animals that are not slaughtered according to Shari'a law, and hammer, and food or drink which contain or mix with hammer. How about the Okay, uh, interesting enough, when I show this slide, I will be okay. I didn't know there are many types of magic. I'm sure you know this, yeah? Because my students in Sabah, I think they are not very familiar. They, they have not heard about Mughalata. I think Mughalata is a heavier. So what is it? I say, oh, about them? I've got wine on my, on my head, on my hand. Do I have to go and clean this clay? You know, these are the questions that they were asking. I say, no, 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 no. It's only Mughalata, the one that, that involves pigs and dogs. <coughs> Mughalata is the lightest. I think it will be the urine of the Baby, two, uh, baby boy, two year, old, two year old, younger, two year old breast milk, and mutawasita is actually in between. Anything at all beside the two, but you just clean it. You don't see the eye, you're done. Yeah, no smell, no, no sight that it is already clean. Okay, I just want to show you on the section three requirements. Uh, section three is talking about eight topics. I just want to emphasize on the management responsibility. This is 3.1 of the standard, the requirements. And what does it say? All right. I don't know why I put all of that. Okay, section 3.1, management responsibility. One, the management shall appoint Muslim halal executive officers or establish a committee which consists of Muslim personnel who are responsible to ensure the effectiveness in implementation of internal halal control system. This is ongoing in Malaysia since 2009. Previously, it was not in place. Every halal certified company in Malaysia must have this. Yeah. A halal executive, a Malaysian permanent worker, a Muslim, has to be trained. Number two, the management shall ensure that they are trained on the halal principle and its application. So they have the technical person to contact, the halal officer, and a committee to refer to. So there must be a committee. A committee normally at least must be three or more than five. If it is a big company. If it is a small company, it is sufficient to have three. But that would be excluding the drivers and the club. We don't expect that. The committee members will be something like from the production line or from the uh, management or from the procurement section. Number three, the management shall ensure that sufficient resources that is when how facility, financial and infrastructure are provided in order to implement the halal control system. This will expect that they will provide the solar room, the, 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 the store, uh, the pantry, everything which is actually to make the workers uh, conducive to work with, I mean to work at. Okay, uh, just to, to give you the brief summary of the Malaysian halal certification, the halal authority in Malaysia since 2011, is the only one now, Jaki, under the Prime Minister. It is the only authority in the country. It is a government entity. I mean, we are very fortunate in that, yeah? So Jaki is short. Halal food certification refers to the evaluation of food processes in its preparation, slaughtering, cleaning, processing, handling, inspection, storage, transportation, and management practices. It confirms, yeah, certification, it confirms the ingredients used in the product are halal certified and the product is free from haram and non-halal products. Uh, so this is how we define uh, uh, halal certified product and 
how long is that fact time says. Okay, let's move on. Why is that moving? Right. Malaysian Halal Certification very important is to industry that's Halal Certificate is an effective marketing tool for, for them to penetrate the local and international market. It is useful for consumer's reference. It is required as evidence during surveillance exercise. But the concept is Halal from food farm, uh, from farm to table. Okay, I think this is quite an old slide. Everybody been seeing this again and again. We expect all the way from farm to slaughter, yeah, to uh, to the um, factory, and then the ingredients, the handling, the packaging, storage, transportation, storage. I think now in Malaysia we are actually establishing the halal logistic uh, flow until to the retailers because we have already the standard. The next slide will show you actually in short how does the process work. It is actually like registration. It's all online now. In Malaysia, uh, we validate account, we send all supporting documents, which are all there in red, in orange, complete, and then the auditor will go down, takes about one month, and then approval final. And then when it is approved, you'll be given the set. When you have your certificate, you are allowed to use that logo. And this is the only logo uh, legal in Malaysia. You cannot use other logo. Yeah? But other logos from color certification body, recognized by Jackie, is allowed. Yeah. So it, 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 the people are very familiar because they have it on Jackie website or the Halal Hub website. Okay, in that order, we still believe that Halal training services is very important. Developing human resource capacity in the Halal sector because we want to ensure complete competencies. It is also to maintain Halal integrity from farm to table. It aims to reach the gap between current level of awareness and understanding and the kind of expertise needed to support the growing halal industry through competent trainers and standardized training modules, training centers, yeah, we have all that, HDCM and NOS, and now we, uh, the Lumar and the Fund. And we are also talking about recognition of international HDBs or halal certification body. This is very important, especially for those who are actually traveling overseas. HDBs, in short, for halal certification body, Functions to certify ingredients and food products as halal before exporting to Malaysia. They have their own local, local halal labeling and local. They need to comply with Malaysian halal laws and standards. Application to Jackie for recognition. Requires equivalent halal certification system. Approval after audit upon compliance and report to Jackie every year. This is the HDO only for those products you export to Malaysia. They only need to have some baseline uh, information. Can you currently Jackie uh, currently recognized 56 halal certification bodies throughout the world and 16 authorities. 16 authorities here talking about those countries in the Middle East. For example, like Kuwait or Yemen. They don't have HCP per se. They have their own authority like Al-Qaf Ministry. So they are actually in that uh, linkage with Jackie. Okay, the specific condition for meat imports to uh, exporters. All meat and meat based products to be exported to Malaysia must be halal. Because this is actually in accordance to the Halal uh, Custom Act 1988. For the purpose of the importation approval, Jackin and the Department of Writing Services Malaysia will conduct inspection or audit to the audit source as was that inclined. Jackin will inspect in terms of halal and we have to inspect in terms of animal hazard food safety. Upon approval of both departments, abattoirs and processing plants will be listed in the Malaysian approved plant list. This is under the DPS website. The halal cert issued by the recognized certificate body will only be valid upon approval from the Malaysian authority. It means uh, the exporters. But then, you are looking at the Malaysian standard halal food production and preparation as the reference, uh, and also as for purpose of auditing, hence the funds must be complying to the standards and protocol. The certification body shall monitor and execute a supervisory role in matters of halal and the plant concern, this supervisory role will be of mutual consent of both the plant management and the certificate body before they are considered for appointment by the Malaysian Authority. Normally, if we have one HCB in one country, we normally will go back to them uh, automatically. The arrangement does not override authorities from Malaysia carrying out full of inspection visits as when as and when the need arises. Uh, this was what happened in Australia and New Zealand. The responsibility of the HCB, the role of the recognized halal set, 
uh, is to oversee the Hala State Estate Plan, and this one does not mean to relinquish the responsibility of the of Jackie. The education body should take the responsibility of ensuring they are all in compliance to our standard. The security body must submit to Jackie the audit reports. The education body shall inform Jackie on any changes. Regarding the plan monitor, the security body shall inform Jackie on any changes in their organization and procedure. The security body shall be responsible to submit a six month report. This is actually on Jackie's website, on Hanan Hub uh, Division website. Okay, what we're doing is actually rebranding uh, Hana. Yeah? Hana logo has now become a symbol of quality and religious compliance, and this makes it sound as if you're being green. Yeah? Hana is quality. We want to tell people that when you talk about Hana, it should be healthy. It should be natural, okay? It should be a premium product. Yeah? It should be humane to animal. It should be environmentally friendly, a green thing. It is a marketing tool, it's a fair trade. If you say it is uh, 500 mil, it should be 500 mil. It should be 490 mil. Yeah? Because it has to be toilet. So what you need to do is actually to work together between the industry, the consumers, and the government. You cannot do it alone. Because to develop a halal industry, you have to do it together. It is actually a concerted effort. It is a, a three-party management approach. Yeah? The industry, you need to be responsible for what you produce. The consumer, you need to be knowledgeable and empower yourself what to buy and what to eat and how to eat. And the HCB need to establish program policies or any uh, non governmental Islamic organization. You need to develop your own halal house. Yeah? So, protecting the integrity of the entire halal value chain is very important. We can afford to, to, to avoid this. And I think for these uh, matters to be uh, in line with the Halal Hub development, you need to run for the challenge. You need to run for the challenge now. Grab the opportunity. Halal is the opportunity of the decade. Maybe of your lifetime. Right, the, it is the right market now, Cape Town. Right place, right time. It is now. You need to make Cape Town being the, the town strategic position in the world to play the leadership role in the global Halal market. Because you are in that route. Yeah? Should revise that again, inshallah. And when we into halal food, meaning it is permissible with good quality, you know, so value, it is profitable for that for Muslims and non Muslims. So you should be capturing the world, not only the Muslim market. You're looking into halal now as a stunning opportunity. Find dining to fast food in the air, the sea, the land, the school, hospital, motivation, retailers, producers, supply, whatever you want. Yeah, healthcare, tourism, cosmetics. There is always a new halal industry sector. Yeah? And then in conclusion, halal food is not only compliant to Sharia requirements, but it's also toy or good. Halal style is important to provide guidelines for stakeholders, the consumers, the government, the industry. Halal certification is important to verify the halal status of a product based on the standard. Halal certified products and services will form quality output to establish the halal industry of any economy. Cape Town halal. Maybe that, that could be a tagline where the business should be. Well, I think that's the value once before you want to bring your, your eyes on. Don't forget that. And you're looking into feeding specifically your captive market, the 2.1 billion Muslims in the world today. And you're looking into global halal travel industry worth at 140 billion US dollars. Get a slice of that cake. Be the upper hand and the lower hand, yeah? Halal integrity for future growth in the global halal industry education and knowledge. And that actually incurred. We need to do more and more training. We are looking into halal food industry is so diversified and will be the next world market force. Halal products are universal. The need for the government the industries to work together. But developing halal industry through standards and certification is the way forward, inshallah. I think that is all I have. My last slide will be, thank you very much for your attention. Halal is a must, not just about what we eat, but also about what we wear and what we love. Thank you so everyone. Thank you so much.